pleasure today to introduce Boris Matek, um, who is a professor at Oxford. Boris got his PhD from Karlsruhe, uh, then moved to Oxford. He's now leading the, uh, the group there, you know, the famous kind of RDF owl inference group with a, with a couple of colleagues. And uh, today he's going to talk about RD Fox, which is the new system they are building, and she's also going to be productized, right? Well, we'll try at least. <laughs> okay. So it sounds super exciting, Boris, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Philip, for having me here, and thank you very much for coming here. Now, I have to like say in advance, I was told that most of the students here will be PhD students, most of the audience will be PhD students who are familiar with RDF. So I see now that there are some other people here. So do I need, do, is everybody here familiar with RDF, or should I give you some background into that? Um, no background needed. Okay, I'll just give you a tiny background. And this is going to be a bit more technical talk, uh, like about the algorithms and the techniques, because it's, again, I was told the audience was going to be mostly uh, PhD students. So um, I'm going to talk, this, this talk will be split into two major blocks. The first one is about the core engine and the reasoning algorithms. And the second one is going to be about some more recent work that we <coughs> are doing in order to increase the scalability of the engine by using um, a cluster-based solution. Uh, so I'm going to start, and we call it RDF Ox, RDF Oxford. We didn't actually come up with a better name at that point. <laughs> so we were writing a paper, and it was a light LaTeX macro, and it stuck, basically. <laughs> so OK, um, as I say, I, I assumed everybody kind of knows RDF, but here is briefly what it is. So it's essentially a semi-structured data format. Uh, you can think, so, so the point of it is you want to put this uh, um, like uh, non-homogeneous data together, and then you, you could do it in a database, but this is quite difficult. You have to harmonize the schema. So because of that, people have invented this format called RDF, which is essentially a graph-based format. So you have your nodes, which basically represent objects, and then you have other nodes, like these ones, which represent classes. So you can say Peter is a professor, and the professor is a surplus of employee, and so on. So you have this kind of network type, net network style of data, essentially. Um, and people are using this for various kinds of uh, applications, you know, from healthcare, uh, data integration, like lots of different kinds of stuff. But I'm not going to talk about applications this much uh, th this, uh, this time. Um, what is interesting in RDF is that RDF provides for reasoning. So because Peter is a professor and professors are subclass of employee, you can infer this red link here, which basically says that Peter is an employee. And then because a professor is a subclass of employee and employee is a subclass of person, you can then uh, infer that professor is a subclass of person and so on. So why do people do this? Well, it simplifies data management. So you can model your domain, uh, you know, separately in an ontology, which basically says, you know, there are people and there are employees and so on. And then when you put this all together, so you load your data into an RDF triple store and then you load your ontology, then you can run these inferences and then you get all this implicit information so that if you're querying for all people, you will get Peter uh, as an answer, even though this wasn't explicitly stated in the database. So that's actually the point of reasoning. And people are actually using it. So I worked with a Spanish company on an application in uh, tourism where they wanted, you know, people querying for accommodation. You should get both hotels and bed and breakfast, for example, just a simple example. Th this can be used for various different reasons. Um, now, the, this style of reasoning where you are actually deriving all these new facts and putting them into data is called materialization. You don't have to do this. So RDF tells you what you need to somehow logically entail. Nobody says that you actually have to use an algorithm which puts these red arcs into the data. You can use top-down reasoning algorithms and so on. But here I'm going to talk about this, what we call bottom-up or materialization, where you essentially somehow you saturate the graph, you compute more and more conclusions, and you put them all into the graph. Now the next question is, uh, well, what formalism do you use to specify which edges to add, and for this we use data log. 
So data log is a well-known language from both uh, knowledge representation and databases. It was the, the, the one good thing that it has is recursion, so it can represent connectivity queries, for example, which you can't do in plain SQL. Um, and you can, for example, axiomatize in data log using rules of this form, um, you know, what needs to be derived. I just want to mention that, well, sometimes people use this weird programs where you have these ages subclass of and, and RDF type, which is then fixed. So you write your program once, you fix it, and then you use it as you wish. But for example, it's much more efficient actually to extract this ontology part, convert it into a data log program, and then apply that because the rules tend to get shorter. Just wanted to mention that as an on a side, it's not core, you know, of this talk. The whole point of this is that the system that I'm going to be talking about is completely agnostic with respect to what kind of program you're using. And actually, we've actually gone beyond just plain data log. We have now data log with mm, stratified negation and aggregation. So, um, you know, you can do quite a lot of data manipulation using that. Um, now, our goal was to develop a new system that allows efficient materialization of data log programs on RDF data. Now, okay, this is not, I mean, we're not the first ones, you know, to be doing this. So we looked a little bit, you know, what, you know, is actually happening now these days in this whole um, area. And we noticed uh, an important trend in database and knowledge-based systems. Uh, you know, price of RAM keeps failing. Uh, falling, sorry, and uh, you know systems with like 128 gigabytes are routine these days. So uh, we have a server 256 gigs um, of RAM. We bought it for about 5,000 pounds, but this is not really a lot of money. Um, and therefore, there is a trend of moving data into memory. So quite a lot of there. I mean, you might be aware that you know there is there are these in-memory databases, SAP HANA, or times 10 by Oracle, Urika by Yark Data. So the idea is, if you put your data into memory, then processing and complex processing of which this materialization example of is going to be easier. And then the another thing is. Uh, well, these modern machines, uh, they have quite a lot of cores. So this laptop here has 16 physical 32 <laughs> virtual cores, for example. Um, so we wanted to refine this goal a bit. So we said, okay, we're going to focus first on main memory systems and on multi-core systems. So we developed some new techniques, which as you will see are fairly efficient uh, for that. Uh, we've developed a new system. Here is a website. We are trying to actually make some money now with it. We'll see whether this will work or not. We are academics and not really very versed in business, but you know, let's hope for the best. Um, so, okay, so what is the problem? Like the main technical issue that we want to address here. So I briefly outlined what is materialization. So you saw these data log programs, they have a body and they have a head, and that essentially means that you evaluate the body as a query, and that gives you bindings for your variables in the head, and then you have to put these facts which you get from the head back into the data and then repeat. So you're essentially running in a loop, lots of queries and lots of updates. And both of these things have been studied but more or less separately. So, for example, uh, a lot of, there was a lot of work on, you know, efficiently querying data and on somehow bulk updates. But in this case, we are going to do this interleaved. And that's actually going to be the main uh, kind of technical problem that I will talk about. So, another thing is like, okay, we could look into, you know, what people have already looked into parallelization of data log reasoning. And if you look at the existing approaches, one of them is you, you can classify them broadly. I mean, this is not a strict classification, but you can classify them broadly into two groups. One, you could say they explore inter-query parallelism. This means parallelism between different queries, i.e. if you have two rules and they are somehow independent, so one doesn't depend on the output of another rule, then you can hopefully run them in parallel because they don't interfere, and then you can actually join the results somehow. The problem with this is that 
the number of independent rules is usually quite low, and especially in these semantic web applications. Um, later I'll mention we did some tests on a high-end server at Oracle with uh, 128 cores, and there is no way you will find actually completely independent 128 rules so that you could actually run them in parallel. So this idea sort of fails. It also fails in existing relational databases simply because you really can't run that many queries parallel on the same data set with the updates on the same data set, but that's like a different story. Another thing is to use intra-query parallelism. So, you know, if you can't actually say I'll partition different rules to different cores in the machine, you can try to partition different parts of a query to different <laughs> machines. And then, you know, there are lots of different, you know, ways to do that. So, for example, one popular way was to par partition rule instantiations to threads. So, if you have n threads, and if, let's assume that your rule body contains a variable x, and let's assume that somehow you convert this x to an integer, or it just is an integer, it, it gets mapped to something which is an integer, then you can say thread i uh, is going to evaluate this rule only if that x mod m is equal to i. Right, so you're somehow adding a predicate and you're saying only for this binding of the rule of the variable x, if, if this is really, you know, one, then I'm doing it. If it's two, then this thread is going to do it. The problem is that this is doing this partitioning statically. So you're deciding in advance how to partition stuff and that's actually bad because you have data skew. So, you know, it could happen that, you know, x mod n is usually two and then your thread number two actually does most of the work, whereas others don't. Um, you can try to do then this dynamically, but then you have load balancing issues and so on. Um, or you can try to par parallelize joint computation. There was a lot of uh, work on computing, like uh, for on parallelizing, for example, sort merge joins or parallelizing hash joins. But again, you know, this is not actually very efficient because you're again updating this data all the time. So, so, so th this gets complicated as well. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to distribute workload to threads evenly and with minimum overhead. And uh, this is also what I already mentioned. So we are going to interleave updates with querying all the time. And that actually brings uh, quite a lot of different, you know, technical challenges. I mean, the data structures like B trees and, and so on that, that are normally used in databases just don't seem to be very, you know, s you know, amenable to this kind of workload. So our solution broadly consists of two kind of parts. One is an algorithm, which is sort of known, but just adapted to this setting. And the other one is a data, new data structure. And I'll talk a little bit more about this data structure, you know, of how we actually maintain the indices and how we update them in parallel. How do we do this efficiently? There was quite, I mean, this was probably the most complicated part of, of the whole shebang, basically. So, um, I, but I'll, I'll still first outline roughly what the algorithm looks like. So the algorithm actually has this property that it just parallelizes the computation quite naturally under the assumptions that your data structures can interleave queries and updates very efficiently and so on, right? So, okay, the algorithm here, I'm going to do this based on an example. So let's assume that this is your data and I mean, okay, I, I said this is RDF, but I sometimes like to, you know, just use standard data log notation. So you have a bunch of facts here, you know, you can represent this in RDF, but that's just somehow boring stuff, basically, I hope. If anybody wants some more explanation, you know, how these triples become this, ask me now. Okay, so I'll assume everybody understands this. And let's assume that we have this one rule which we want to apply to this data set. So it's actually quite simple. So what we do is we walk through this data set and we basically say, okay, well, if this fact somehow needs to be applied to this rule. Well, let me try and find the positions where this rule, where this fact could match to this rule. Well, it can match here. If I match this fact there, then this X becomes an A. And now I have to check whether A of A also holds in the data. But there is a snag <laughs> uh, because there is A of A here, but hopefully you can already see 
I'm going to go through all the facts, and now I get this derivation twice, once when I get RAB, and once when I get to here, A of A, right? So but I don't want to do this twice. People have already noticed that doing this kind of stuff twice is kind of pointless. So what we essentially do is we, we evaluate the subquery, but we look at facts only that are up. So we have some ordering on facts, essentially. Um, this essentially means that when I'm here on this fact, you know, nothing happens because this A of A doesn't count. It's below this current pointer, essentially. So, okay, now I go to the next fact and uh, I stick it in here. I again get the subquery A of A, but A of A is below, so nothing happens. You know, I carry on. And now finally I get to A of A. I put it in here. I get a subquery RXY. Uh, now I have this here, that's my current subquery. And then I can evaluate this here up and I get, you know, B and C because this subquery matches here and here. I get these two facts which I then put there and, you know, I continue basically. So this is under the assumption that the algorithm works on just one thread. That's the basic idea. So this is, I mean, it's not nothing super fancy. It's what was already sort of known in data log as the semi-naive algorithm, which essentially has this property that it never derives the same fact twice through the same rule, essentially. But what is nice about this fact, uh, about this algorithm? First, whenever I'm applying, so, so what I've done here is I've somehow broken this, uh, this, this problem of computing this materialization into lots of little subqueries. So for each of these facts, I got a subquery, which I had to evaluate. And mind you, the, I, I'm evaluating this only with respect to facts that were above. So this means that part of the database doesn't change because, you know, it's above, it, we, we went through it, it's, it's, it's done. And that essentially means that when I extract one of these facts and I stick it in, in somewhere in the rule, then I get a subquery which can be evaluated independently of any other subqueries for any other fact, essentially. And that really means that I can have multiple threads, all of which, you know, move this pointer, extract the fact out, evaluate the subquery, put the data in, move the pointer, and so on. And the, the nice thing is that all of these um, uh, actions are completely independent. So the problem paralyzes nicely. And uh, we've just, and also you can note that there is no need for synchronization. So you just walk this pointer down. Whenever a thread is finished, it's finished. It doesn't need to wait on other threads. There are no need for locking or for anything. Uh, no need for any kind of load balancing. You know, when you get to the end, you get to the end. That's, you know, what, what happens essentially. So, um, you know, very simple idea, but it actually, as you will see, works well, modulo some important, you know, details which I will describe shortly. Um, so, as I say, we partition rule instances, so you can look at this as this intra-query parallelism, a version of it that, uh, that I mentioned earlier, um, because we partition, you know, the same rule to different threads, but we do this dynamically and with little overhead. So there is no scheduling, basically. There, there is no scheduler in this kind of a system. Now, I have to point out that even though, you know, this algorithm seemed to, you know, work very well, there is a situation where, you know, I could have one million threads, but on this specific uh, program here, they will not, this will not work. And why is that? Um, so if you can notice these objects, A, B, C, D, E, are ar arranged in a line, kind of they follow each other. And that now means that, okay, I'm going through them and I get to here. I match this to this body. I get, you know, a subquery which then derives A, B. But I derive just one fact. So now there is nothing for other threads to do, basically. So. Um, you know, then I derive A of C, A of D, A of E, but you know, each time I derive one fact which feeds into just one thread. So I wanted to point this out, I mean, first of all, data log is a p-time complete language in data complexity. And, you know, we don't know this for sure, this is one of like the open complexity problems, but, you know, we, there is a big, you know, assumption that 
p time doesn't parallelize. So this essentially means that, you know, hopefully one day we will prove that no algorithm will parallelize well in all situations. Okay, so there is going to be a corner case, and this is one, essentially. But it is good to know what does this corner case look like, and I mean, what we've actually seen is that in uh, you know practical kind of situations, this doesn't really occur that often. Okay, so this was the algorithm. No big deal, actually. It's fairly simple, and uh, it parallelizes well, and so on. But there was much more. Um, it was much more difficult to actually achieve this from a purely technical, you know, systems point of view. I have this, you know, database of triples, which I somehow need to keep querying and updating all the time. And, um, you know, how do we do this so that, you know, these like 128 threads can constantly keep accessing it and not block each other? You have to somehow ensure, you know, integrity of your indices and so on. So that actually turned out to be a much more complicated, purely kind of technical issue, essentially. So what we did for this purpose is we devised a new um, data structure for indexing RDF data, which is tailored to main memory. We will try to put it on disk. Um, maybe we have a shot at, you know, SSDs, because the point is we will use random access here, and obviously on, on a spinning disk there is no chance. But on an SSD, maybe there is a chance. Uh, we'll see about that. But for RAM, you know, the assumption is that random access is sort of cheap. I mean, there is still the question of cache misses. I'll talk a little bit about this later. Um, but, you know, at least it's not as bad <laughs> as on disk, essentially. So, okay. The first thing that we do is what people always do in these triple stores. We basically represent objects, you know, A, B, C, U, R, I's, and so on. We represent them as integers, so that's why you see a bunch of integers rather than, you know, any kind of names, Peter, Paul, and so on. So that's uh, well known. And then what we use is we use a six-column table, essentially, to index all the data. So each row corresponds to one triple. And we are 